Hello everyone. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, why am I standing like this? <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to be discussing how to color grade in DaVinci Resolve specifically for 8-bit footage, for Sony 8-bit footage. So, that can include the A6400, the A7 III, A7S II, stuff like that. All of those cameras, they're all 8-bit color. And if you don't understand 8-bit color, then essentially it's just a more compressed colored space or colored bit depth that your camera records in to to minimize the file size so it's just throwing out some information and just using an algorithm to put it back together so you lose some color information which means that it's harder for you to adjust and push the colors in post-production that's not too huge of a problem because davinci resolve is such a strong tool and most people do not do extremely dramatic color uh, looks so you don't have to worry too much about that you can still get decent looks with um, these cameras but the first thing that you got to understand is that when you're shooting you need to be shooting in the right picture profile which is s log 2 or s log 3. if you want to experiment with s log 3 you can it does give you a little bit more dynamic range. That's something that you kind of got to work out the logistics a little bit more. But if you want to just start with something that's consistent, it's going to work. It's going to work right. It's going to work well. Do S-Log2. Um, I shoot in S-Log2 and s at 3. I don't do s at 3cine because it has like a weird magenta tint for some reason on these cameras. So, or on at least my camera. So I do s at 3. And then I do noise reduction. I do a little bit of sharpening and then I start putting my magic onto it. And then I convert it into Rec. 709 and then I start messing with the enhancer to make it look a little bit more like film. So, noise reduction. Let me just disable all of these and go to what it looks straight out of the camera. So, um, actually, this is what it looks like straight out of the camera. It looks kind of low, but this is because I wanted to not clip the highlights. This is a big thing. Don't clip your highlights. Try not to clip your highlights at least. At least on your not your subject. If you can, try not to clip them at all. And how you can know to not clip them is on your camera, you have zebras. If you go into zebras, you're going to see a custom setting where you can adjust the lower limit. The lower limit for S-Log3 is... 95 plus or 94 plus i do 94 because it's safer i do 94 plus for s log 3 and then for s log 2 it's at 106 i think but i do 105 because it's safer to do it at 105 so 105 plus lower limit 105 plus and what that's going to do is that as you raise up your exposure when the zebras show up you're going to see the zebras when your highlights clip so now you know when you see the zebras your highlights are clipping, so then that now you tone it back down, and then when you don't see the zebras anymore, you have essentially exposed to the right. You have essentially exposed all the way up until just the clipping point, and then moved it back a little bit, and that allows you to retain as much information as possible. You can maintain more information in the shadows, you can still bring down the highlights, and you just have a whole lot more to work with in post-production. So. If you're going to expose on those cameras, that's how I would expose and how you would typically expose with pretty much any camera. So that's something to understand. You can do a lot with DaVinci Resolve's noise reduction tool. So this is something that you would use a lot if you're going to be shooting in 8-bit on Sony's cameras. So for here, I'm going to be adding noise reduction and how I would add noise reduction is by going Onto uh, make a node and then go into motion effects down here and I do one frame you can do up to three anything over three is kind of not recommended because it really eats into your PC's CPU so I would recommend doing one or three I do one just because I don't feel like I need that heavy of a calculation but that's up to your decision so I put it on better and then here in this clip I'm not moving too much so I do it at around large medium I do it at around medium if I'm not moving that much I'm gonna do small and then if I'm moving a lot I'm gonna do large next disable this and when you start doing noise reduction here you won't be looking down at your scopes here so I'm gonna pull this up and I'm gonna start from zero pull up and you're gonna see if you look down at the scopes here this is the scopes look down here 
you're going to see it kind of recede a bit. So you just want to increase it until it recedes just enough and you don't want to go too much over that. Next, you want to do the chroma. So we're going to do the chroma. It's going to do just a very subtle amount. And then now I'm going to go to spatial noise reduction. On spatial noise reduction, I do better because enhanced is a lot on your computer. But if you want to do enhanced, you can control these separately. Um, I just keep this on small. But I'm going to do better. And then I'm going to look at my scopes here and increase this. All right, that should be good. We're going to move on. So now that's how you apply your nose reduction. If you look at this before and after, you're going to notice that there's a subtle change in noise reduction. Most of your noise is really just going to be in your shadows. So you want to be looking into your shadows. Let me just find an area with shadows, probably this lens right here. So if I uh, enable, disable, enable, disable, this stuff is a whole lot more dramatic when you do low light stuff, which we're going to see in the next clip. But um, this is more well lit so there's a whole lot less noise next um sharpening uh, i go to this tool and then i press shift h and then pull this uh go on this tool this triangle right here i pull this down to like around 0 0.04 and then shift h press a b pull this down until i get just the edges you don't want to do too much Press Shift H twice, and then you're going to exit, and you can look at the edges here, and you'll see that we have sharpened it a subtle amount, which is good. Next, CSTs. CSTs are going to be the base of your um, of how you color grade in DaVinci. So CSTs are color space transforms. So essentially, you're going to be transitioning from the color space that your camera shot in into a much wider color space so that you can work with more colors. So in DaVinci Resolve, the widest color space is DaVinci Wide Gamut. So we put in Sony S Gamut 3, and then in our gamma, we put Sony S Log 2 because that's what we shot in. Next, we're going to put DaVinci Wide Gamut. Um, and on the gamma, we're going to put DaVinci Intermediate. Now at the very end, we're going to have, not at the very end, but right here, we're going to have another CST. Uh, you can just look it up on the search bar. You can just look up color, and then you'll see color space transform. So on this one, we're going to be putting it to Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4, because Gamma 2.4 is like standard for broadcast and YouTube and stuff like that. Next, I have a node for HDR. HDR is this powerful tool right here. On these, on this tool, you can mess with all of these exposure settings. I might get more into depth on this, how this works in a in a later video, but um, it is really powerful for controlling your highlights and your shadows. Then I have another uh, node for balance and exposure. So this is basically allowing me to make sure that my colors match up. So for example, here in the offset, I have reduced my red by 24 here because before if I if I take this off um, or if I reset this there was like a red hue and I didn't like that so I moved the red down a little bit and you can check that by clicking on this tool right here you click on this tool and then you can hover over a certain area that is neutral so whether that be blacks grays or whites if you look over a neutral space if all of your colors are more even and no color is way too high or way too low, um, then you've balanced those colors out in the offset section. Something I should, probably should have prefaced earlier is that offset, gain, gamma, and lift are the most powerful tools that you will be using when you color grade. These are what we call the primaries, so or the primary wheels. And that is what we will be using this tab for when we start getting into creating looks. So moving back to balance and exposure, this is what I do to bring up my balance and bring up my exposure. So if I reset this, you're going to notice that on the scopes, I have my shadows down here and my highlights up here, and then my midtones are all the way down here. I want to bring my midtones up a little bit. So what I did is I reduced my highlights because I didn't want to, or not my highlights, but the brightest parts of my image. So in gain, gain controls the brighter parts of your image gamma controls mainly the midtones and then lift controls all of the dark parts of the image so here what i did is i 
brought up the gamma to bring in some exposure. I reduced my highlights a little bit because I didn't want them to clip. Bring up my gamma a little bit more and then I brought down my shadows just to add a little bit more punch. And that's essentially all I really did for balancing the exposure. This is just something you can mess around with up to your taste and what you're trying to display regarding the tone and the mood of your shot. Next, I have a primary node. So this is where I can make my look or work with the colors in this color space. So we're, again, in CST, we're moving to a more flexible color space before we go back into Rec. 709, which is the standard broadcast color space. So in here, I have essentially uh, most of your look, the primary part of your look is mainly going to reside in the gamma section. So we usually start with gamma. So in gamma, I moved it down towards the greens because I wanted to have, or well, not the greens, but like this green blue side. Um, so I can make a more cool look in these parts of the image here. And then I brought the highlights and gain up more towards the orange. This is something that you can just kind of play around with until you find something you like. And then you can do more subtle adjustments in um, these areas where you can just uh, control each of these RGB values independently with left clicking on your mouse. And then you can kind of be a little bit more precise with that. I'm, uh, I'm gonna stay with this. I think this looks decent. Um, it's a very dramatic change from where I was before. And then on HSL, so what I use this for is, well, I, this stands for Hue, Saturation, Luminance. Um, so I go into this icon right here. It's like a curve icon. And I mess with these sliders. So on Hue versus Hue, this is going to allow you to take a certain hue and shift its color. So when you're working with 8-bit footage, it's easier to prevent breaking colors too much by widening this range. So I would increase this to, uh, towards the orange, increase this more towards the deeper reds, so that when I pull this color, it's not breaking so much. We're working in DaVinci Wide Gamut, so we're pretty safe for the most part, but you can still pull this to a pretty extreme direction. If I wanted to make this pink for some reason, I totally could. Um, if I want to make this orange more of a more of an orange color, I totally could. And then I can make this tone more saturated if I wanted to. Like I could select this same color and then uh, bring this out, bring this in, and then reduce this or increase the saturation here. And then I can go into hue versus luminance. So this is going to take this same hue and then I can increase or decrease this lumin uh, the luminance or how bright this particular hue is. So I can make this deeper if I want to. So I can make it deeper like this, or I can make it brighter if I want to. So you, this concept applies to pretty much any color in here. When it comes to color grading 8-bit footage, you don't really want to use the qualifier. You want to not use the qualifier, this qualifier tool as much as possible because if you try to use it, there's a lot more room for you to break the image when you are trying to adjust colors through the qualifier than through just using um, your hue saturation luminance tool. Next, masks. So I don't have any masks in this image, but let's say I wanted to bring up the exposure on the face and reduce the exposure on the outside. I can just add a mask here and then I can go in, make a shape and then kind of bring this uh, or soften it out. And then I can kind of bring up the gain on it and brighten up that part of the image. Don't do it too much because you're going to make your image look washed out. Or I could inverse this and make, uh, make it look darker. Something I've done in a previous video is I made like a little light strip thing where I made, I took a, this one of these radio filters, I made it pretty narrow and then I put it and slashed it across the image. And then I kind of made it softer. I like did a less intense version of it, softened it a little bit more. And you can do that on some parts of your image to kind of create a more, it allows you to create more depth and allow 
you to focus on a certain part of the image. So I want to focus on my face, so I create this mask here, and then I can darken these parts here. So that's something interesting you can mess with. I don't do it too often, but there's some situations where I'm like, okay, I, I kind of need to fix the lighting on this a little bit, or adjust it just, just a little bit, or tweak it just to guide the viewer towards where I want them to look. Because typically people look at the brighter parts of an image. So if you can adjust the image so that the darker parts are away from your subject and the brighter parts are more towards your subject, then people are going to look towards where you want them to look. So um, that's something to consider. So this is what I have just straight out the bat, 8-bit, just within DaVinci Resolve. Now I'm going to implement Dehancer. So Dehancer um, is going to just dramatic, dramatically change it. But when I'm getting into Dehancer, I typically do Rec 709. I don't really like messing with the other stuff because I like the control that I have in the node tree, in my node tree, before going into Dehancer. Any sort of exposure stuff, I like the control I have with exposure in the HDR tool. So I'm not going to do much adjustments in exposure and color within Dehancer. I am pretty much I pretty much only like doing using Dehancer for the film looks, the print, the vignette, monitoring, and some of the other tools. I'm gonna get to those. So Rec 709 on the input film. Let's say I want to do uh let's say I wanna do like impre not impressa. Let's not do that. Minolta, nope. Let's do they got this interesting Lomochrome purple. Um, I don't know what I would use it for, but if you find this interesting, then that's a look. Um, they got Role, that's a too flat for me. Uh, I'm gonna just do Kodak Portra 400. So, Kodak Portra 400, I'm gonna go into the developer, and in the developer you can adjust the contrast, make this a little bit more punchy um, and then on the color boost you can boost the colors just a little bit don't push it too much or it's gonna get a little wonky um, I noticed that I have a little bit too much warmth in this image so I'm gonna go into my primaries and then I'm going to reduce the the reds on the highlights because that's kind of where they are so I'm gonna reduce the reds on the highlights and then now we're at a more neutral position from where I was before and then on expand this is essentially just allows you to push and pull the highlights I'm not going to mess with that because I would rather do it in the HDR wheels, but this uh, certain film stocks have certain dynamic ranges, so that's something to consider. Certain film stocks cannot reach a certain threshold within, uh, or like highlights roll off and shadows clip at a certain point. So that's something to consider and something you can adjust and play around with if you're wanting to expand your highlights a little bit more um, and create more contrast in your image. Print. Print is where there's a lot of interesting looks that can go on. Um, I think that the... But I'm going to just stay on Kodak and Dura Gloss paper. And then in prints, you can increase the color density. What people like about film is typically the more deep, dense colors. So that's where you would adjust it. You'd go into prints and adjust the color density. So I can make this red a whole lot deeper, which I like. And this isn't the best color grade. Uh, this is kind of just something real quick. So if I want to show you an actual color grade, I'm going to go into the next clip. This is an actual color grade that I have done. Um, and I prefer this a whole lot more than what I was doing in the previous clip. I did the previous clip just so I could kind of explain the general concept of color grading for 8-bit footage. Now I'm going more into what I like about Dehancer and some stuff I would improve on it. So for this, I like how, okay, this is what it looks like before Dehancer. This is what it looks like before any sort of color adjustment. So this is what I have initially. So these are my reds. They're, my reds are kind of a little pinkish. And then there's like some golds and yellows here and some greens and blues. But they're not, they're kind of just there. <laughs> so this is just standard Rec. 709. There's nothing that's like giving me this is creative or nothing giving me like this is an interesting world. This is kind of just a very standard, just basic world. So we create our own world by going into our primaries and then adjusting it, making it look a certain way to try to convey a certain mood. So we do that mainly in the primaries. And then 
um, just messing around with this. So I have a lot more green tones here. So this is a very dramatic, like kind of Hong Kong-esque type vibe that I'm going for. So I made the tones a little bit more green, mainly like in the shadows, a little bit more green. Or not the shadows, but like in the overall image, it's a bit more green. And then on my highlights, I have my highlights a little bit leaning more towards red. And then I go into Dehancer and boom, like everything just comes out. And what I like about Dehancer is like, I can make my overall adjustments before Dehancer. And then within Dehancer, I can bring out the colors that would be harder for me to do on my own. Because hypothetically, you could individually pick each color, go into the HSL, and try to adjust each of these colors to try to reach what this is giving. But you can't... It's not very efficient. You're going to be tinkering around with this so much. So what Dehancer does is it allows you to pull these vibrant, deep colors out with just just the ease of the plugin. So I think that that's pretty cool. So what this tool can provide for you is an easier, simpler way to achieve these type of colors. Um, and then when you're using it... Uh, you can monitor your exposure pretty well too with this monitoring false color tool. This is some, a tool that I actually do like using. So I can see like I, I'm crushing my, my shadows a little bit here, but I kind of want to. Like in film, oftentimes if you have a, 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 an image with a lot of dynamic range in film, it often isn't able to pull information from the shadows. So that's kind of just a natural part of film. But it's really good at maintaining the highlights. So that's something that you want to consider when you're trying to adjust an image to look like film. You want to try to save your highlights, give it some softness, and then make your shadows deep. So this is what I'm essentially doing here. And, uh, and then here I'm like not clipping too much. It's like clipping here, but like not extremely, it's not red, but it's still pretty much clipped. But the overall halo around the light is not clipping which is what I'm going for. So that's that's a pretty cool exposure tool. It gives you 16 zones, um, so you can kind of get into the nitty gritty of the different contrast ratios within the image, so I like that. I don't know if it's exactly EL zone. It could be going off of the stops, but that's like a whole nother discussion about like EL zone and using monitoring based off of actual stops and all that that's like a whole nother discussion i don't even know if you understand what i'm talking about but um with this tool this false color tool that's pretty cool i think uh, if they implemented eel zone that would be interesting though and then you can make your own luts and you can adjust if you want to do high quality or low quality based off of your computer so that's pretty dope vignetting tool is pretty interesting um you can uh gauge it by using the feather tool so i would feather this out all the way or defeather it all the way so that I can kind of see where it is and then I can adjust the aspect ratio like this and make it fit the image that I weigh the way I, that I want it to so I want most of the focus to be around here so I want to draw people's perspective towards the bright parts of the image and towards the center so I make the center brighter and then the edge of it I can make it a little darker because I don't really care if people look at the edges so I can do that darken the edges and then feather it out all the way and then it looks like this that's something nice that is within dehancer i think the vignetting here is a whole lot smoother than it is if you were to do it manually with um with this radial filter so i think that's pretty cool overscan it's like you can make like the super 8 looking vibe that's this is what over like overscan gate weave Film breathe, all of that is like to emulate like the motion of film as it's rolling on on a projector. You can emulate Super 8 and all that. I'm not really too into that. And if I'm going to make a round border, I prefer not to do it in here. What I prefer to do is I prefer to uh, go into my edit tab, go into effects, add an adjustment layer, and then I go put this adjustment layer into the fusion tab. Um, I don't know why it's monitoring it like that. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Add this adjustment layer into the fu uh, fusion tab, add a rectangle, and then I bring the values on this rectangle to 0.975. And then same thing here, 975. 
and then on my corner corner radius I go to 0.15 and boom I have like a cool 35 millimeter film looking border um, that's pretty nice and retro use it for your IG or your uh, or whatever you want to put it on but you can do some pretty cool stuff with this. You can make it look more like a uh, like a four by three aspect ratio if you want to by doing bringing it down to like uh, seven seven seventy five. Do seventy seventy five. It's like more of like a four by three aspect ratio, uh, which is more of like a thirty five millimeter film look. So you can do that. But if I'm gonna do some sort of black round border retro type of thing that I want to do for Instagram or YouTube. I'm going to typically do it through an adjustment clip just because I can apply it to the whole thing and I don't have to like go into the nitty gritty individually for each clip. And also the exposure on it is pure black. It's not like overscan for Dehancer. If I go into Dehancer and turn the overscan on, the thing about it is it's like not pure black. It's like light black and I kind of don't like that. I want it to be pure black. And then the edges are like a little rough. Some people might like the rough edges, but I kind of just want it to be clean black, clean edges, maybe softening a little bit. So that's up to your personal preference, but I wish that it was like clean black. So that's my only input. Halation is pretty cool. Um, I added halation because I'm going for that Hong Kong film aesthetic. So um, I have halation here to kind of bring out these red hues and the edges. And like uh, in film, halation is essentially like when they're scanning it, the the red hues or parts of the image are like shifting as they they scan it. I don't un fully understand the process, but that's kind of from my understanding of what uh, of what that is. So um, it's an interesting look. Um, just don't overdo it because if you overdo it, it looks a little crazy. Um, Bloom, I'm not too into Bloom. I'm not a Bloom person. Uh, color head. Color head is you can adjust the colors and stuff in there. Um, so, like, you can do all of that. But I'm not into using the color head for adjusting colors. I would prefer to adjust the colors through the primaries. Because I am more comfortable and I feel like I have more control over the colors in the primaries. So, that's my take on that because I can control the highlights to be red not just the general colors to be red I can control the shadows to be green and not just the general space to be green so I have more control over those specific tones I just prefer using it they have there's a little more intricacy in the controls on uh, the color head like in here but I'm just not in too into using it I want to simplify my workflow. I don't want to have so much complicated settings within just applying this look. I want to do overall and then just slap the look on. And that's generally what people want to do when they're filmmaking because there's so much other things to think about. So they don't want to overcomplicate things. And that's speaking of overcomplicating. Something I also don't like about Dehancer is um, the, the layout of it. Look at this layout. I'm like clicking on all of these. And it's just like, there's so many different sections to go into. And you scroll and scroll and scroll to try to get to each one. How I would have laid this out is I would have had tabs. Like I would have input here, film here, this here, this here, this here. I would have it in like little square tabs and I would lay it out like that. And then I would have you be able to click on it and you can just m memorize the arrangement or learn the arrangement of all your settings and just click wherever you need to click if you want to edit something. And that would make it so much more intuitive and you wouldn't have to scroll back and forth, back and forth. It's just tedious to scroll back and forth like that. So I would have preferred if they laid it out in a tab format. I don't know if that's possible in the plugin, but I think that if they laid it out as tabs, it would just be a whole lot more intuitive. This is another clip that I did where I went for a completely different approach. So you can do this no tree, which you have more control over, but in some cases, if you're doing raw or you're shooting in raw, um, you can input your camera's profile within the enhancer. So by choosing camera and then choosing whatever camera you actually shot it with, 
and then controlling pretty much everything within here. When it comes to exposure, I still prefer to use HDR and the primaries. I feel like I still, I, I just prefer controlling it in that way. But you can hypothetically do it all within Dehancer. Besides that, it's, uh, it's something that I'm just like, I'd rather do it in these nodes. Because look at this. Zoom in here on this candle. Without the HDR tool, this candle is blown out. If I enable this, and then I go into my specular highlights, not my specular, oh yeah, my specular, turn down my specular, and then go into this spline tool right here, and then shift it down all the way up to this other highlight part, it rolls off this highlight so well, I don't have to worry about it clipping, and that's so dope, so that's why I like using the HDR tool, but make sure to put it more towards the beginning of your node tree. Another thing that I don't like is that it supports all of these different softwares. It supports Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro, DaVinci Resolve, which is the main one. And when it comes to photography, it supports Lightroom, it supports uh, Capture One and some of these other softwares, but it doesn't support Darktable. I really like using Darktable for my photography. It's free, it's pretty intuitive, it processes images pretty well. I like Darktable, and it's more accessible to people, and I feel like there's a lot of people who use Darktable, but they haven't made a plugin for Darktable. But they made a plugin for these other photo editing softwares that people don't really use. I know more pe a decent amount of people who use Darktable. There's even like a decent amount of content creators that are specifically like have tutorials for Darktable on YouTube. and. They haven't made a plugin for Darktable. I don't know if that's some sort of licensing issue or something, or some sort of agreement, or if they've ever reached out to Darktable, but I feel like if they had an a plugin for Darktable, it would be pretty cool. Cause like Darktable may be free, but I like I would buy that plugin. This is just off topic tangent in general. Me and many other people who are colorists who use DaVinci really love DaVinci's tools. But some of us are photographers and we would love if Blackmagic made essentially the color page of DaVinci and just put it into a photo editing software. If Blackmagic decided to make a photo editing software, they would probably blow Lightroom out of the water. Lightroom would be like the second option. If, if Blackmagic ever saw this, make a photo editing software. That would be so cool. But that's, that's off topic. Back to Dehancer. If you are somebody who's trying to emulate film, the cost would come out to be less than if you were to shoot, shoot film for the whole year in general. So I think that that's interesting. It is on the higher end of the pricing, but if you'd like to try it out and get a 10% discount, my code is LNTN. Um, they did send me it to give my opinion on it. There's, there's some things that I feel could improve and there's some things that I feel um, are pretty cool about it. They also have a mobile app. I'm going to get into the mobile app later. Um, I feel like not everybody's really here for the mobile app so if that's something you're interested in you can skip to it but i'm not uh, i'm not really tripping if you're not interested into the uh in the mobile app people here are mainly for color grading on 8-bit and how dehancer could possibly make their look better yeah i think uh if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments. Um, I know that this is a really rambly video because I'm not used to doing these talking heads, but I appreciate it if you decided to stick around. Yeah, but if you're interested in the film sec- in the- not the film section, if you're interested in the phone section, we're gonna get into the mobile app of Dehancer right now. Alright, so I'm in the Dehancer app right now, and here you can see that I have a little test image that I decided to put up and I can save looks. So this is a look that I came up with earlier and I just saved it. So that's cool. You can have presets and in here you can choose your print. So I want to do, let's say I want to do a Kodak 2383. I can go into expand. You have pretty much all of the settings that you have in the Dehancer plugin for DaVinci Resolve, but there's uh, a little, some stuff that ju are just not there. Uh, but you can still have some pretty interesting 
looks going on like you can do impress i think that's pretty cool and then you can control your highlights roll off you can like expand it um make it pop a little bit more like here i can bring it down so now my highlights are a little bit brighter but they're not uh clipping i wish they had the false color tool in here i think the false color tool in the app would be pretty cool but um besides that like this is let me just show what it looks like before this is what it looks like raw this is the raw image um and then this is what it looks like after so that's pretty cool but to be honest uh <laughs> i kind of wish that you could like set up a whole series of images in the app and then you can edit a whole series of images because this would be more intuitive for people who are actually like photographers that are on the run trying to uh, edit photos on the run on their phone like if you could edit multiple photos or photos in bulk instead of having to pick each individual one and and go into that and, and like there's no section where i could go in to a separate tab and scroll through all my images and and and, and flip through all of them if i could do that then that would be so nice but it's not in here and i think it's just maybe the limitations of the software but i feel like it would be pretty intuitive if you could just flip through a whole bunch of different images that you shot so that you can kind of make everything look a little more consistent instead of having to pick each individual one but i think you can still get some pretty decent looks but uh that's all for me